If you have a Bible or a way to access your Bible, we're going to be in Mark chapter 12 today. And we are continuing a series we've been calling Kingdom Challenges. Uh, This is the final week in the life of Jesus. You know, he comes into Jerusalem on this Holy Week Sunday, rides in on the, 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 uh, the Palm Sunday donkey, the symbol of the coming king. The crowd thinks he's the Messiah. Monday he comes into the temple and he judges it. And on Tuesday when he comes in, the people who run the temple are not happy with him. And so one after another, Jesus has encounters with those who would challenge his kingdom message. And he issues his challenges that we're calling kingdom challenges. And so last time we looked at that moment where uh, one of the groups that came to challenge Jesus were the Sadducees. I said that they don't believe in resurrection and that's why they're sad. You see, you remember that old joke. But what we'll see today is that they will step off the stage. Uh, Jesus will have challenged them so powerfully, you know, as he says, is it because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God? But onto the stage will emerge another figure. And here in this encounter will come one of the greatest, most important questions that has ever been asked. And a question that all of us, in some way, shape, or form in our life, need to think about the answer to this question. This religious leader will come to Jesus and they will say, there in Solomon's porticos in front of everybody, what is the greatest commandment? Now, uh, the title of our message today is, isn't being a Christian just obeying the Ten Commandments? And the reason for that title is because that to, it's, it's not unusual for someone to come to me and say, you know, pastor, isn't being a Christian just following the Ten Commandments? And why that is appropriate is because when Jesus is asked the question, what is the greatest commandment, it's interesting that he doesn't mention the 10. So what does he say? And what is the answer to this incredibly important question? It's found for us in the 12th chapter of Mark's gospel, and we're gonna read verses 28 through 34, and let's see how Jesus answers it. In Mark chapter 12, verse 28, it says that one of the teachers of the law, in the original language, grammatus, uh, we get the word grammar from that, it's a scribe, a person who's dedicated their life to the reading and the copying of the scriptures. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. So the, the scene is, Jesus has been carrying on this conversation, and this guy's kind of been sitting in the sideline. He's been kind of watching all this happen, and now it's his turn to to jump in. Noticing that Jesus had given them a a good answer, he, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Bible translators kind of struggle with how to translate this word, because in the original language, it is the word we have in, in English, proton. It's where we get our word priority. What is first? What is most important? And then Jesus gives the answer, verse 29. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is this, and and by the way, it's interesting, he only asks for one, Jesus gives him two for the price of one. In verse 31, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. Verse 32, well said, teacher, the man replied. You're right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. This man gives Jesus high marks. Just imagine someone grading Jesus. To love him with all of your heart, with all of your understanding, with all of your strength. Notice he changes the words a little bit. To love your neighbor as uh, as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now that's not what Jesus was saying, but that's what he says. In verse 34 When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, (laughs) no one dared ask him any more questions. Question and answer time, Q&A, ended at that moment. 
This is the end of the Q&A on Tuesday for Jesus. But what is the answer to this question? What is the greatest commandment? And how are we to understand it and apply the greatest commandment into our lives? I think the best way to go about trying to figure this out is by going back in this moment and trying as best we can to understand what's happening here. And it, it really starts with the person who is asking the question. So who is this person asking the question? Well, as we said already, this happens inside of that part of the temple, the, the outer part of it, outside of the main part of the temple is the court of Gentiles. Outside of that is Solomon's portico. And you can see here in this picture, uh, Jesus out there in the, in the courts, the religious leaders are out there, the crowd's out there. They step off the stage, and then this one person emerges and asks Jesus a question. Now, it's interesting that Mark's gospel doesn't tell us who this guy is, but Matthew gives us a better idea of who he, of who he was. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 34, 35, and 36, this is the way Matthew describes this moment. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, so those guys step off the stage, the Pharisees, that other group of Jews, about 6,000 in number, Josephus tells us, they got together. One of them, one of them was an expert in the law, or as our text calls him, a teacher, a scribe, and tested him with this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law. In other words, this man who comes to Jesus isn't just any old ordinary guy. This is the teacher of the Pharisees. This is the teacher of the teachers. This is the rabbi of the rabbis who's been waiting until the very end to ask his question. And it's the kind of question that rabbis of the day asked and they still ask 2,000 years later today. Jewish rabbis through the centuries have, have asked this question again and again. We have literature that documents these kinds of questions. What is the weightiest of the commands? Ancient rabbis used to declare that there were 613 commandments in the Old Testament given by Moses. And you say, well, how do they know that? And the answer is they, they counted it. Many times they counted it. And if you go and count it, you know, you're going to come up with that number as, as well. In fact, some rabbis would divide that 613 into two groups. They would say that there are 365 negative precepts corresponding to the number of solar days in a year, 365 days a year. So, hey, you can be negative every single day of the year if you want. And there were 248 positive commandments corresponding, they said, to the number of members of a human body. In other words, they used anatomy and physiology to figure this stuff out. Now, this is the kind of thing that they spent their time thinking about. What is the weightiest of the commandments? Later, Judaism, in, in a book called the Talmud, which is, of course, the famous book of modern Jews, they simplified all of the laws down to, they said David reduced them to 11 essential principles. Isaiah reduced them to six. Micah to three, remember that passage that talked about acting justly and loving mercy and walking humbly with your God? They said that Isaiah, another said Isaiah reduced it to two and that Amos reduced it to one. In other words, this was a question people really wanted to know. There's a lot of laws in the Bible, 613 that Moses gave us. What is the real one we need to focus our attention on? Or put another way, not what are the laws that we can obey and the ones we don't have to, but what is the fundamental premise of the law on which all the individual commands depend? What is first? That's a great question, and I imagine that if you and I were asked that question, we might think of lots of different possible answers. Knowing the Bible that we do, we might have thought of different answers, but what we see here is Jesus' answer, and I want us to think about what is the answer that Jesus gives. Today, though, if we're really honest in our world, many of us as Christians living in America and the Western world, we have grown up learning, thinking about the importance of what I like to call the Charlton Heston moment, you know, when Moses went up on the mountain with the Ten Commandments. Charlton Heston, of course, is the actor in the, in the famed movie, The Ten Commandments. 
standing there with the, with the tablets in his hand. The, this famous moment where God, the God of heaven, gives to his people the ten, the top ten, the, the basic laws of his people, uh, which are described for us in this Bible infographic. I love this, I love this graphic because it gives you something to kind of pair with each one of the ten. You know, number one, you shall make no other gods. Number two, you can see like the little golden calf there. You shall make no idols. You shall not, not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. See the little OMG, oh my God. Keep the Sabbath day holy. You know, it's got a little picture of a church, like, hey, go to church. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear fault witness, and you shall not covet. It's got little pictures there of things to kind of help us to think about that. Now, now if, if we're honest, the, the tendency for us would be to answer with one of those. I mean, we wouldn't have been surprised if Jesus had said, well, actually, the first or the second of the Ten Commandments is the most important thing. But it's interesting that he doesn't name any of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are found in our Bibles in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy, Deuteros Namas, is the second giving of the law. Deuteros Namas means second law. And so in the second giving of the law, in Deuteronomy 5, we get the Ten Commandments. But the verse that Jesus quotes from the Old Testament, the law that he says is the prior first class law of all laws, is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. We can put it here on the screen. And Jesus quotes it in this passage, and it says, Hear, O Israel, this is what Deuteronomy says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord. By the way, when you're reading your Bibles in the Old Testament and you see the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, what we call all caps, that is the holy, unpronounceable, sacred name of God, Yahweh. Yahweh, our God. Yahweh is one. Love Yahweh, your God, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. This basic um, instruction probably would not have surprised anyone who heard Jesus say it. It, it. it might surprise us because we're expecting him to say the Ten Commandments, but it wouldn't have surprised people in that time because this was actually the daily prayer of Jews in the ancient world, and still today, this is the daily prayer of Jewish people. They pray this prayer three times a day, in the morning, the afternoon, the evening, and they name this prayer based on the first word in Hebrew in the passage which says, hear. In Hebrew, the word is shema. Maybe you've heard of the shema. If you know a Jewish person, you've probably heard them say something about the shema. The shema is, shema Israel, the Lord your God is one. And they pray this prayer every day, three times a day. It was the most important prayer in Judaism, so they wouldn't have been surprised that Jesus would have mentioned this particular one. This particular prayer is part of the moment when God does give the Ten Commandments to Israel. And in, and in, and, and in giving it to them, then says, hear this, write these things down. It actually says in that original passage, bind them on your, on your arm, put them on your forehead, and you may have seen Orthodox Jewish people today with some leather things wrapped around their wrist, around their head, and you're like, what in the world are they wearing? And the answer is, is they bound copies of the Bible on their arms and on their forehead. It's kind of, it's kind of like you know, me taking my Bible here and getting some super glue out and just kind of doing like this. And you walk around like that. And they do that because they're trying to literally fulfill that. If you go to a Jewish person's home, they may have at the door a little piece of metal there on the front of the door called a mezuzah, and that is because it says to, to write the scriptures on the doorpost of your house. And it says where you go, when you walk, when you talk to your children, when you teach your children, you should remember these instructions. Hear Israel, your God is one. Now love your Lord, the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and remember these things that he's told you to do. And that's what they would try to do literally, and they still try to do that today literally. But let's be honest, God didn't write those instructions for us to just bind them on our arms or bind them on our heads or write them on our, in front of our doors, but he wants to write them on our hearts. He wants us to live these instructions out in our life. It's more than just going through the religious motion of attaching something religious to your body it's about living it out. And living it out, this is where Jesus does something surprising. Deuteronomy 6.4 would not have been that surprising. But what he says next, the second command, 
he says, is to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, a lot of us in this room might remember that Deuteronomy 6, 4 is the Shema, but a lot of people who know the command to love your neighbor as yourself don't know where it's found in the Bible. It's not found in Genesis. It's not found in Exodus. It's not found in Deuteronomy. It's not found among the 10 or even around the 10. It's found in the book of Leviticus and in one of the weirdest chapters in the entire Bible, the 19th chapter that's filled with all kinds of strange instructions, is tucked this little verse, Leviticus 19, 18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This instruction that Jesus refers to in this passage, it's not the first time Jesus ever refers to it, actually. If you go back and read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, when he comes to the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter seven, it's found in Matthew five, six, and seven. You come to the end of it in Matthew seven, twelve. he gives what we have come to call the golden rule. Have you ever heard of the golden rule? It's he who has all the gold makes all the rules, you know, that's the old saying. But actually, the, the phrase golden rule is not even in the Bible. It comes from a about 400 years ago, an Anglican priest used the word, and we've, even one, Rome, one, uh, one emperor uh, took it and wrote it in gold on the wall, uh, which is probably not a bad idea, but it says to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's a form of this ancient command. But what Jesus does here is so interesting, is he takes the word love, which is used for our love for God, that we should love God with all of our heart, the daily prayer, the understanding of what we should do, and he takes it and he says, you know what, if you and I really love God like this, it's gonna show up in our life and how we love the people that are around us, our neighbors. How we love others is an indication of how we love him. Jesus connects the vertical to the horizontal in this particular passage. And Jesus does something in this moment that challenges, uh, challenges us. You know, over the last few weeks, as I've been kind of getting ready to preach this sermon, I've spent a lot of time just thinking about what does it really look like to love God with all of my heart, with all of my strength, with all of my mind? What does it really look to, look to love God like that? And what does it look like to love other people, as, to, to love them in, in the way that Jesus describes in this passage, loving your neighbor as yourself? And I just want to challenge you this week to take that question and live with it, to think about what would it really look like to do this thing that Jesus says is the most important thing in all of Scripture, to love God and to love our neighbor. What would it look like in your life to do that? And are you doing that well? Because the reality is, is that Sometimes when we start talking about loving our neighbor at church, the sermon, I, I like to say, goes from preaching to meddling. Because we all would go and come here today and say, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. But how many of us are proud about the way we love other people? How many of us can say in the way that we interact with others, you can see our vertical love for God? Now that's an incredible answer that Jesus gives and it's something for us to live with and think about and, and really try to understand for ourselves. But one of the things that's amazing in this moment, what is shocking in this moment, where is Jesus when he says, this is the greatest commandment? He is standing in the temple precincts. You look over there and you can see the temple, the court, the court of the women, the court of the men. You can see the interior where the, where the holies is and then in the part you can't see because it's separated by a veil, the holy of holies. The, the thousands of people have come into the city, tens of thousands. Josephus says something like hundreds of thousands. There will be so many sacrifices, Josephus says, for every family that's in Jerusalem that as many as 200,000 lambs will be killed this, that, that weekend on that Thursday and Friday. So much so that he says, Josephus does, that the streets, the city streets of Jerusalem ran red with blood. Thousands of priests conducting sacrifices and rituals and prayers. All of that is people have gathered by the hundreds of thousands from every corner of the Roman Empire to gather in the center of all Judaism 
for this single moment to celebrate the Passover. And what Jesus says as he stands there in the face of the temple is nothing about all of that. That's striking, but there's a reason for it. It's Tuesday, and Friday's coming. And on Friday, Jesus Christ is going to die on a cross. He is going to become the full and final atonement for sin. There will never need to be another sacrifice offered in Jerusalem and in that temple. There will be no longer a need for a priest because he is the high priest, the mediator between God and his people. And now we can come immediately into the presence of God through the atoning sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ. The temple and all that is associated with it is about to be made obsolete because the full and final sacrifice is about to be made. The Bible says, how do we know what love is? God laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Now, the question in this passage of what is the greatest commandment is one of the greatest questions. The answer Jesus gives is one of the greatest answers. The problem is, this is my problem, this is your problem, how do we do it? How do we do this? How do we really love God more than all the things that sort of vie for our attention? How do we love God more than our career? How do we love God more than our possessions? How do we love God more than our passions? How do we love God more than anything in our life? How do we love him more than all of that? And how can we love our neighbor? Have you met my neighbor? Have you met that person? How do we love that person? What does that even look like? These are questions for us to think about. Now Jesus says all that and the, and the religious scribe compliments Jesus. He's, you know, you've answered well. Jesus in response to his response acknowledges his own wisdom and then says this to the man. He says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now that sounds like a compliment But stop and think about it for a minute. When Jesus says to this man who has spent his entire life studying God's word, trying to live it out, he is the teacher of the Pharisaic order, he is the most devout man you could just about ever find in Judaism. Even he, Jesus says, has not made it in. If you're not far from the kingdom, that's good, but it still means you're not in the kingdom. This compliment hides a reality, a truth, that sometimes is true of people who come to church. I'm in church. You're not far from the kingdom. I grew up in a Christian family. You're not far from the kingdom. But it also means that you're not automatically in the kingdom of God. You know, Billy Graham used to be really famous for talking about just because you're a Christian, just because you're in church doesn't mean you're a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a car. And this is the truth, isn't it? That what Jesus is saying to that man, he might be saying to someone here today or somebody watching right now. You you know the Bible, you know the Christian faith, you know the Christian religion, you, you do some of the stuff here. You're not far from it, but you're not in it. You're not actually in the kingdom. You're just near it. You're close by, you're skirting the edges of it. You have an interest, it's a hobby of yours. So what does it mean to be in the kingdom? To be in the kingdom of God does not mean that one simply approves of what Jesus is saying here. It means that one submits entirely to Jesus' authority in person. In order to be in the kingdom of God, Jesus becomes your king. He becomes your Lord. And in that passage it says, I love him with all of my heart. I love him with all of my strength. I love him with all of my mind. My steps, my life are ordered by my Lord. He rules and reigns over all the things that my life is shaped for and about. There's another person, Jesus says something like this too, about not being not far from the kingdom of God. And it's in John chapter three. It's his encounter of Jesus that that evening with Nicodemus. Jesus, uh, this is from the Chosen movie, of course, Jesus and Nicodemus. I call that the original Nick at Night, you know, moment, if you remember that old show. 
This is when Jesus interacts with Nicodemus, who was also one of the great teachers of Pharisaical Judaism. And Jesus says to him in John chapter three, he says, in order for you to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. (laughs) You don't get in because you're religious. You don't get in because you're even a Pharisee. You don't get in because of all the things that you do. You must become a born again. What's that mean? It means that you have to get in by acknowledging that you have no merit to be in. You come in humbly, you come in by faith, you come in on your knees, you come in by acknowledging that only by the good grace and mercy and the love of a a saving God do I come into the presence of this God. You have to be born again, you have to come in like a child. Now in response to that, Jesus says to Nicodemus, who doesn't understand it, you'll remember that, he's like, how do I go back into my mother's womb? In John 3.10, Jesus said, you're Israel's teacher and you don't understand these things? You're the teacher and you don't get it? You're telling everybody else about it, but you don't see the kingdom? You don't understand the kingdom? You don't even recognize, you might say, the king. Now there's something Jesus says in that conversation that we often skip over that helps us understand what's going on there. When Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, one of the things that he says between John 3 at the beginning of the verse and John 10, the one I just read to you, is he makes this comment about the Holy Spirit. He talks about how the Spirit, people who who have the spiritual eyes can understand the things of the Spirit, and people who are fleshly can understand the things of the flesh. And in a sense, Jesus is making a point. Nicodemus, in all your humanity... And all that you can do as a human being, you will never see the kingdom of God. Because to see the kingdom, to enter the kingdom, to become a part of the kingdom is not a human endeavor, it is a spiritual enterprise. Being born again is not about following a bunch of rules and rituals and commandments and doing this and doing that. It is completely surrendering your life to the lordship of Jesus Christ. It is where it begins. It is the new birth moment, and from that you can begin to see and begin to understand what it is to be a part of the kingdom of God. What is the greatest commandment? And Jesus gives it to us in this passage. It's not one of the lists in the Bible. The greatest commandment is not to obey the ten. It is to obey the one. It is to obey Jesus, the king of of his kingdom, and in this he offers us a kingdom challenge. You know, through the years I've made the comment, others have said this, I think it may go back to the revivalist, evangelist Charles Finney may have said it first, I'm not sure, but that the distance from heaven and hell is calculated in 18 inches. That if you were to measure the distance between heaven and hell, you would measure it in 18 inches. That is the approximate average or median distance of a human human head from a human heart. In other words, it's entirely possible to be the greatest teacher in all of the history of the world, in the scriptures of God, and to be still not in the kingdom of God. You can have it all up here today. You can have it all up here But if you do not have it here, love the Lord your God with all of your heart. You can miss it. That's a kingdom challenge. Would you pray with me? Father, as we come to the end of this message and as we continue our worship today, we reflect on the greatest command that's in Scripture. And Lord, we acknowledge today that as you're teaching from the Shema, the the, the great prayer of the Jewish people, to acknowledge that the identity of who you are, but more importantly, our response to who you are, to love you with all of our heart. That God, that that is just simply a doorway today into us understanding that you are the Lord. And so Lord, in this moment, the question for each one of us is are you truly the Lord of our life? Are you truly the Lord of our heart? Are you truly the one we serve above all others? And then God, is that so true in our lives that it is demonstrated 
in how we love each other. God in this moment, God in this place, move among us, move inside of us. Let us shift away from the idols of our life into the God who alone is Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.